Hi YouTube. It's been at least a couple months since I did a video. I've been super busy with moving to a new house and trying to get everything unpacked and organized and I just haven't had the time to sit down and do a video. As soon as I get the house the way I want it, I'm planning to do a video showing off the new house or at least show some pictures. Moving is a slow process and it moves sometimes at the pace of glaciers. <laughs> When I moved to the farmhouse nine years ago, I found boxes still packed from when my husband and I moved into our previous home, so bear with me. I've done a series of videos on my toxic borderline sister-in-law, and I thought I was done with the series because I moved away and went no contact. But of course, the drama never stops with these people, and I had to make another video because she sent me another one of her toxic text messages. Narcissists will find a way to try to pull you back into the drama, or hoovering, as it's called. Like I said, I've been no contact since January. The kids and I moved to a brand new house that is nowhere near this woman. We used to live right next door to her because we lived in my grandmother's farmhouse, which is next to my parents' house. My toxic sister-in-law and my brother still live with my parents, even though they pushed for us to move and even went through all of our stuff that was left behind before we could get completely moved out of the house. I covered this in another video, how the first day after we moved, they came into the house with their entire family and started throwing our stuff around and then threw it into a pile so that they could clean the carpets and clean everything in the house. The link to that video is below. The push was supposedly so they could move in with their foster child. The last video on my security camera was of Christina, my sister-in-law, walking into the house, seeing the camera, and going straight to it and turning it off. Their actions were a blatant invasion of privacy. When I asked my parents to give us a couple weeks to move out of the house, we weren't even given a day. Now, the funny part of all this is that they still live with my parents, even though they were practically pushing us out of the house as quickly as possible. I told my mother when we moved that the house has mold in it and lead paint peeling off the walls. Of course they didn't believe me, but it looks like the social worker saw the house and told them that it has to be made livable before they can move in with their foster baby. This led to them gutting the house and completely removing all the sheetrock and flooring. I found out all this recently when the family had to get together on the weekend my uncle died. And that is where this video picks up in the ongoing saga of my toxic sister-in-law. I can only hope that this will be the last in the series, but with narcissists, you never know. Now, remember, I've gone no contact with this woman. She is blocked on all social media, and I don't live next to her any longer. I want nothing to do with her or my brother, and I certainly don't want to know anything that is going on with their potential adoption of a foster baby. I have spent $60,000 of my retirement fund in order to pay for a down payment for a house. I've taken on a mortgage every month in order to avoid this woman like the plague. I think she's unstable and dangerous. She sent me a 2012 word text message telling me what a horrible person I am and challenging me to a fight. I was worried that if I continued living next to her that at some point she would do something to try and get me arrested or charge me with a crime. The last two months have been great, not having to deal with her, but a couple weeks ago, that changed. I got a call from my aunt. She said I needed to come see my uncle as soon as possible. He had, he's had cancer off and on for the last 13 years. It started with pancreatic cancer that was caught early enough they could take out part of his pancreas and get all the cancer, or at least that's what they thought. Eventually, it led to a long battle with esophageal cancer and finally lung cancer, bone cancer, and then once it spread to his lymph nodes, it, it took over his entire body. I, I fucking hate cancer. I Excuse my language, but why is it that good people get cancer and die, and horrible people seem to live forever? Anyways, my uncle had fell, and because his bones were so weak, he broke his femur. The surgery to repair his leg was too much for him, and the doctors sent him home on hospice. My aunt felt like he had days to live, and she was right. Once I got to his house and saw him for myself, I knew he, he maybe had days or hours to live. I've seen enough people die in the ER to know when the end is near. Normally, I have some professional detachment, but obviously when it's your loved one, all professionalism just goes right out the window. It's gut-wrenching to watch someone you love suffer and to struggle for every breath and, and fight through the pain because they don't want to leave you. 
and I think that was the case with my uncle, that he was so stubborn and strong, and he wanted to, to be around for his family. Now, my aunt and uncle and their children are normal people. They're not like my family of origin. When I would visit them in the summer, I would leave their home sad, knowing that something wasn't right about my family. The way they treated their children was the complete opposite of the family I grew up in, with me being the scapegoat and my brother the golden child who could do no wrong. The family dynamics don't change just because you, you get older. I'm still the scapegoat, and now I have the golden child's wife th treating me like the scapegoat as well. Anyways, I took the kids out of school after my aunt called, and I took some time off work. They live about six hours away, so I waited until the morning to drive up. My parents were already there, and my mother told me that my brother and his wife and foster baby were driving up after they got off work. I knew I wasn't going to be able to avoid this woman all weekend, but I was going to, do, to just pretend like she didn't exist. I was going to be gray rock because I wanted to be able to say goodbye to my uncle and also help my aunt with cleaning the house or cooking or whatever she needed. I was there for my aunt. My mother was already judging my cousin for sleeping late. She said to me, it's 2.30 in the afternoon and your cousin is still sleeping. Now, my cousin works night shift like I do in a hospital. Normally, when I work night shift, I'm not up by 2.30 in the afternoon either. I could never get my mother to understand that my day is 12 hours different. She would get upset when we lived next to, next to them if she cooked dinner and I wasn't in the mood to eat. 5.30 in the afternoon for me is like most people's 5.30 a.m. That's breakfast. I have a hard time waking up in the afternoon to go to work and eating a plate of barbecue and coleslaw and hush puppies. I mean... Here my cousin is having to deal with knowing her father's dying, but still having to go to work at night because she's a single mother, and my mother's judging her. In addition, my, my cousin has strep throat and a fever, and she felt like crap. Her father was dying, and she was depressed, and all my mother could do was judge her for sleeping late. <sighs> Anyways, I kept myself busy cleaning the house and cooking for the family. When I wasn't doing that, I was sitting at my uncle's bedside playing music on the television. My uncle was a phenomenal guitar player and even played with the lead guitarist of the Eagles back before they were famous. He had a recording studio in his home and a whole room dedicated to his guitar collection. My uncle had been very successful in business, so he lived in a very nice large house in a golf community. My kids had never seen this house because they had moved in, into it a few years ago and their jaws just dropped when we were driving through the neighborhood. I'm sure that's a fact that didn't escape my sister-in-law when they showed up. I'm sure my sister-in-law is a gold digger as well with, the, with her spending habits. She thought she was marrying into money when she snagged my brother. She found out that she married the wrong side of the family. She should have went after my cousin if she wanted to fund her spending habits. My kids saw her walking around my uncle's house just staring at everything in amazement. I'm surprised that we didn't trip over the drool on the floor. Anyways, that's off topic. Basically, I did everything I could to avoid this woman all weekend, but she made it hard. They got off work at 6 p.m. and then went and picked up their foster baby from daycare and drove to her sister's house to drop off their dogs. Of course, my brother always has to have meat and potatoes at every meal, so instead of stopping at some place quick, they stopped for dinner at a Cracker Barrel and it took two hours to eat. I mean, this was late on a Friday night. By that time, a huge rainstorm came up, and there was traffic from an accident on the interstate. They didn't get into town until almost 2 a.m. with the foster baby that refused to sleep. So the next day, they were sleeping in. I guess it's okay for them to sleep in, but not me or my cousin. The golden child and his wife can do whatever they want, I guess. When they did finally show up, my brother went straight to my uncle's bedside, and cried these huge crocodile tears. He sat at his bedside for a few minutes with my aunt, trying to console him. I, I really feel like he should have been consoling her, but Christina, my sister-in-law, was loving the attention she was getting from having the baby in the center of the living room. People from my aunt's family and friends of my uncle were visiting as well, and she found every opportunity to try to get people to ask her about the baby. It was weird that she didn't let anyone else hold the baby. It's like she wants the baby all to herself, but she loves the attention of being a mother, or being known as a mother, if, if that makes any sense. 
My narcissistic ex would put on a big show in public like he was father of the year when our daughter was a baby. He would hold her in church and change her diaper or play with her, and all the women in the Sunday school class would praise him for being such a good daddy. It made me ill to watch it because I knew as soon as we got home he would be a completely different person. I don't know if this is the case with Christina, but with how gray my brother's hair has gotten over the past few months, I can only surmise there's a similar dynamic going on in their household. He looks so much older these days and tired. So while this show was going on in the family room, I kept to myself. I put my earphones in my ears and I sat on the opposite side of the room looking at my phone. I was playing games, Facebooking, watching TikTok, anything to not say anything to this woman or give her any attention. She even tried to engage me in conversation by saying her doctor had said that Olivia, the foster baby, has such a great immune system as because she let her go to daycare and be exposed to all the germs. I knew it was a shot over my bow trying to engage me because it was almost word for word what she had said in her 2012 word text message about how I'm a horrible nurse and I don't know the first thing about immune systems and germs. I didn't engage. I continued to look at my phone and pretended like she wasn't talking. I wasn't going to take the bait. However, the only thing I said to her all weekend, and really it wasn't to her, it was just as a general comment to the group in the room, was that I didn't think the baby would take a nap. Christina had fought this baby all morning to try and take a nap in my uncle's office, and the baby just wasn't going to do it. I said, when my kids were little, they had a hard time sleeping in a strange place, especially if they were off their schedule. She may not want to take a nap. I even said this when she was not in the room. Like I said, the comment was not directed at her, but somehow I would pay for that comment later with one of her famous nasty text messages. So that night, I was still trying to avoid her when she sat down at the dinner table. So I ate, I ate my dinner at the kids' table in the kitchen so that I didn't have to sit near, near her. I had helped cook dinner for the whole family, and then I cleaned the kitchen. My kids had been helpful all day by keeping the younger kids occupied. My daughter especially stayed away from Christina and my brother because they have a problem with her having a girlfriend. She doesn't fit into their conservative Christian worldview, and she's uncomfortable around them. Frankly, I'm uncomfortable around them as well. When some of my uncle's friends came over, I could hear Christina sigh from across the room when one of them stated that they were sure they wouldn't be able to recognize me as it had been 20 years since they had seen me, but then the wife of one of my uncle's friends said, Julie, you know, that's, that's what they call me. Julie, you haven't changed a bit. You look exactly the same as you did 20 years ago. Every time someone asked me a medical question, Christina would sigh deeply. I, I could hear her like, ugh, ugh, ugh. And every time. I've been told in the past my best, by my best friend that she thinks Daniel and Christina are jealous of me, and I think that might be true. I know that narcissists can have a lot of jealousy towards those they think are doing better than them. I had helped her get a job at my hospital as a nurse's aide, and she had quit that job after six months. She got another job at the hospital and quit it even sooner than six months. So later that night, I couldn't sleep. The kids and I had gone back to the hotel, and I was very depressed. My aunt and uncle had always treated me like their daughter. I used to think the universe had made a mistake, when I was born to my parents. I was more like my aunt and uncle than my parents and wondered what my life would have been like had I been born their daughter instead. My uncle also didn't get along with Christina. I never realized how crazy she was until the pandemic. I won't go into too much detail because I don't want this video to be flagged, but let's just say she believed every conspiracy theory and even some theories that would make most conspiracy theorists laugh at how ridiculous her ideas were. She was posting them all over Facebook and Instagram and getting into arguments with people on Facebook. And her and my brother were doing some things that were dangerous or at least could endanger others or my parents and it could make them sick. My uncle pointed this out to my brother in an email. I don't think my uncle said anything negative or rude, but Christina takes anything you say and twists the words. She immediately blocked my aunt and uncle on social media and told them to mind their own business. I was honestly surprised that she had shown up that weekend. He was placed on hospice. So I was depressed that night, knowing that my uncle would probably die sometime during the night. I've seen a lot of people die over the past few years. I don't think any nurse that worked in the ER doesn't have some level of PTSD after everything that's happened. 
I stayed up late after midnight talking to my daughter, telling her stories about my uncle from my childhood. I was sad that my favorite uncle was quickly losing his battle with cancer. I got a call at 6 a.m. from my mother telling me that my uncle had passed away at 5.30. I told her that the kids and I would get a little more sleep and then come over to the house. The kids and I rested a little longer and then got up and went to the house to try and help my aunt clean up and to help hospice. They came and got my uncle, and my aunt was busy doing things. She was trying to stay as busy as possible to not have to think about things. I was worried about her that once everyone left, she would just break down after having time to think about things. I helped break down the hospital bed so hospice could take it and help put the bedroom furniture back in its place. A couple hours later, my brother and Christina came in with the baby. He went straight for the kitchen and started making himself and his wife and kids scrambled eggs and bacon. I remember thinking, what the hell are you doing dirtying up the kitchen and eating my aunt's food? They had breakfast at the hotel, but my brother said the eggs at the hotel weren't any good. I, would, I wouldn't have the nerve to come into my aunt's house after my uncle died and immediately make myself an omelet. Like... Like, you know, stop at McDonald's or Starbucks. Get yourself something to eat. Don't come and mooch off our aunt's food. I mean, would you like some eggs Benedict? <sighs> I was still doing everything I could to avoid Christina. I was sitting at the kitchen table talking with my uncle's longtime friends. Um, I had known them all my life and even, even was friends with their daughter. We had played together as kids and went to school together. My daughter said that she noticed how Christina didn't like the fact that I fit in with these people. I even told a joke at the breakfast table when we were sitting around drinking coffee in order to lighten the mood. My uncle's friend had asked my mother if she was going to the viewing before the cremation. She said that she thought that they would allow the family to watch the casket as it was placed into the oven for cremation if they wanted. My mother freaked at this point and said frantically, no, 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 I can't watch that. I can't watch that. And no, that they can't make us do that. My uncle's friend reassured her that she thought that that wasn't the case. I said very casually, My ex-husband said instead of cremation, he wanted to be launched out of the cannon into his casket. My mother frowned and said, Well, your ex-husband was always so stupid. I answered and said, My ex-husband said he wanted to be shot out of the cannon when he died. And I said to him, Why wait? This caused the whole table to burst into laughter. It's very odd that sometimes in the most stressful or sad situations, we as humans use humor as a coping mechanism. I'm sure Christina didn't like this either. This was a stressful and sad weekend, and my aunt decided to have a memorial service later this year in our hometown where the rest of his friends and relatives could attend. I had to get the kids back to school on Monday, so we left later that afternoon. It was a long six-hour drive, and I was almost home when a text message alert came over my phone. I sync my phone with the screen in my car so it'll read my text messages to me. I saw the text message come on the screen from Christina and I knew it was going to be something ridiculous. And I said out loud, what in the world do you want from me, woman? I've done nothing to you this weekend. My kids were laughing because they've come to think of Christina's text messages or text essays as they like to call them as comical. Now remember, I had nothing to do with this woman all weekend. I was Gray Rock, and the only time that I even acknowledged her existence was when I said to the people in the living room while she was out that I didn't think the baby would take a nap because her schedule was off and she was in a strange place. So, this is the text message. I'm going to read it in her voice. It's significantly shorter than the 2012 word manifesto she wrote a few months ago. So, here we go. I know that you hate me and have no use for me, and that is totally okay. But you really need to learn to keep your mouth off of me and not voice your opinion on things that I do with Olivia. You really are in no position to tell me how to handle her. You are a miserable person, and it shows. I feel sorry for you, and I'm thankful Daniel got a great sister-in-law, definitely better than the one I got. But I'm giving you fair warning now. The next time that you make any wisecracks towards me, like you have the last two days, I will call you out. I don't care who is around or where we are at. Mm. Ugh, okay. <sighs> let, me, let me break this down. Rem remember, I had no contact with this woman for two days and tried to be as boring as possible. 
gray rock as possible. I spent the majority of my time sitting at my dying uncle's side, talking to him, comforting him, comforting my cousins, cleaning the house, cooking, whatever. Where did I have time to make any wisecracks towards her? It really disturbs me that here a man was dying and she had to make it all about her and the supposed beef she has with me. I didn't give her the satisfaction of a confrontation and she just couldn't let that go. I mean, first off, she says, you need to learn to keep your mouth off of me. Oh, trust me, honey, there is no part of me that I want in contact with any part of your body and certainly not in my mouth. My, my God, I would, I would have to get a tetanus shot or a rabies shot after that. Ugh. Sorry, that was mean. She says I'm a miserable person and she feels sorry for me. Sorry for what? It was obvious she was jealous the whole weekend. I know she hated when my uncle's friends asked me about my new job. I just recently got a promotion at work. I'm the clinical nurse supervisor in addition to the charge nurse. I get to train brand new nurses and orient them to the emergency department. I have two bachelor's degrees. One is a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. The other one is an education degree from when I was a school teacher before the kids were born. I, I couldn't help but be happy and positive when I was talking about my new job that I love, that, that I was born to do it. I'm, I'm a good fit for this job. I, I get to educate people and be a nurse. I guess when she says Daniel got a great sister-in-law, she must be talking about her sister because I've never told her anything about my former sister-in-law. It also disturbs me that she says she's given me fair warning that the next time I, you make wisecracks, you know, that she's going to call me out no matter where we are. I mean, seriously, is she going to make a scene at my uncle's funeral? Because that is the only place I could think of where I would even be in the same room with her. She's the reason I don't go to my parents' house for Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, whatever, because I don't want to be in the same room with her. I guess she really wanted to make a scene when my uncle was dying, but had to be on her best behavior. I don't understand the mindset of someone that would spend a whole weekend listening to my every word, hoping for a confrontation, just looking for evidence or ammunition to use against me. I don't think calling me out or causing a scene would get her the attention or the satisfaction she wants. It would get her attention, but it's not the kind of attention she wants. She wants to paint me as the family scapegoat in front of my extended family, and it's not going to work. And even if she tried, it would only make her look crazy, because I'm not going to engage her in any kind of fight, either verbal or physical. Her challenging me to a fight in her 2012-word text message was the main reason the kids and I moved. The move cost me $60,000 of my retirement money so I, so I could escape. Of course, her actions have now cost my brother his prized pickup truck. The moment that we moved out, she and my brother decided they were going to move in, but it's been over two months, and they still haven't moved into the old house. I think the social worker told them it was going to need a lot of work. That, Like I said, they've gutted the house, removing all the sheetrock that had lead paint on it and mold behind it, ripped up the carpets, the ones my daughter glitter bombed, and are replacing them with laminate flooring that looks like hard wood. At least this is all coming from my mother. I figured out he was selling his large pickup truck because I got behind him one day when he was leaving work. He works in the town where I moved to, and there's no mistaking his truck for anyone else's. It's a large pickup truck with lights up, up, up and down the sides and dual smokestacks to make it look like an 18-wheeler. Normally, a truck like that sells for $70,000, and he had two of them. He, has a, he had a for sale sign in the back. I guess he had to sell his truck to pay for all the home improvements they were putting, in, putting into the money pit house that I lived in for so long. I also moved because I learned from my mother that I would not be inheriting the house, even though I had spent thousands of dollars on improvements on it over the years, such as a new roof, new water heater, painting, landscaping, installing a gravel driveway, new dishwasher, fridge, etc., etc., there was always some improvement project on the house, and even with all those improvements, it was making me and the kids sick from the mold behind the walls. So I've ignored this text message, like all the others. I can only hope that my silence causes her to stew in her own juices. I blocked her number on my phone, and she has been blocked on all my social media for over a year now. I let my mother know about the text message because I thought surely she saw how I behaved that weekend and how I didn't say anything to Christina. But in true fashion, my mother took her side. 
She said, just ignore her and be the bigger person. Life is too short to stay away from your family simply because you don't like one of them. The Christina I know and the one you know are two different people. My mother is blind to whatever this woman does, and I think it's because I'm the family scapegoat. But it's also that she sees this woman as a second daughter, and I'm the daughter just causing problems. It made me sad to see my mother hug Christina when they left like she was never going to see her again, even though they lived together, and then not hug me when I left. I pointed this out to my mom that she never hugs me, but has no problem hugging Christina. She said, you know me, I'm not a hugger. I would have hugged you if I thought you wanted a hug. Seriously, my uncle had just died and she couldn't hug me, but she could hug my toxic sister-in-law. My mother said, I'll hug you the next time I see you again, but I don't know when that will be since you've moved to town. I literally moved 15 minutes away and she acts like I moved across the country. She went on to make me feel guilty by saying, I still look for your car in the driveway when I look at the old house. I forget that you're not there anymore. I'm not sure what to make of my mother's actions. I think there's some element of dementia, but at the same time, there's a lot of manipulation there as well. Anyways, I would love to hear your thoughts on how to handle this situation or to just continue ignoring my sister-in-law's ridiculous text messages. I have a ring camera on my new front doorbell and a security system in my new home. I don't think my sister-in-law would be crazy enough to try to confront me in my home, but with narcissists, you never know. Please leave a thumbs up and a comment below, and please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when I upload a new video. I'm hoping to get a video out later this month showcasing the new house and also another installment to the series Narcissists Are Ridiculous. But until then, remember, you're not the crazy one. It's the narcissist who's crazy and ridiculous. Take care.